what's good y'all it's your boy ross back at again with another video so we're gonna check out 10 most harmful losses in wwe history now the momentum of talent or or a particular wrestler tends to sometimes in wwe or even as of late more than sometimes can get derailed with losses how many times have we seen from nxt talent be so popular be so over to get to the main roster and you really don't have to change much but they decide to change them whether it's character wise ring appearance whatever the situation is and then they have a harmful law a harmful loss that does not help them i'm not saying every person from nxt is supposed to go undefeated but i am saying certain losses could really hurt a, a person's character especially if they're needing to win particular matches to get over with more of the casual fan on monday night raw or friday night smackdown it's hard to get someone over if they can't win very important matches and this has happened time and time again with talent from nxt coming to the main roster and they just end up losing and they don't ever really get the momentum they ever truly had from the jump. So we're going to check this out. Appreciate all the love and support, man. I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of NXT stars on here. And let's get right into this bad boy. Everybody likes to win. I like to win. But I don't always win. And that makes me sad. Wrestlers like to win too, but weirdly, it's not actually up to how good they are at things like being really good at Connect 4. Yes, I'm still sore about that, little nephew Benny! You know I didn't mean to put it there! For wrestlers, what? the decision about whether they Ooh. win or lose is made for them. And sometimes, yeah. that decision is very, very wrong. Yep. <laughs> Many careers have been derailed by a steady stream of bad WWE booking over the years. But sometimes you can isolate one specific match mm -hmm. where it has ended any chance of that character ever working again. I'm Ollie Davis, hailing from Parts for Known, and these are the 10 most harmful losses in WWE history. Should be a good history. list. Before I get into the list, please do give us a subscribe at Parts Ricochet's for Known. Ricochet's one of those individuals that shows suffered much more about greatly wrestling, from Like Adam Blompier's 10 wrestlers losses. who survived horrible debuts. Watch that right after this. Before we get into the list, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to this video's sponsor, Raid right, Shadow Legend. So Bliss beats Bailey, Extreme Rules 2017. Not every entry on this list completely kills the career of the person losing. Yeah. In this case, it was just enough to kill their massively over babyface character and push. There have been few rivalries quite as damaging to a babyface as the Alexa Bliss feud was to Bailey in 2017. Despite being the shining beacon of sunshine, smiles, and rainbows in NXT, mm -hmm. and probably the easiest babyface to book in years, Bailey was having a hard time on Raw. She'd openly admitted that she didn't deserve to be the Raw Women's Champion, and then after that, she lost the title to Alexa Bliss in her hometown. Yeah. It was under the good old fashioned Kendo Stick on a Pole match rules. Taking place at Extreme Rules that year, the story of the match was meant to be Bailey finding a way to overcome her self imposed moral disadvantage that she wouldn't use a weapon to win to regain her title from the dastardly Bliss. Instead, she lost. <laughs> in WWE. Yeah. Baby that, faces lose. That remember that kid. That makes so much sense, man. That, granted, Bailey was still able to overcome that, which is awesome, like character-wise, and what she ended up doing in the future, which is very, very great. But outside of that, WWE has not been good with booking baby faces in quite some time. It's, it's like they don't know how to. heroes lose here. Number 9, CM Punk beats Ryback, Hell in a Cell 2012. By itself, in a vacuum, this match actually feels like a bit of a success. And mm -hmm. a vacuum, funnily enough, is an appropriate place to put this match because it sucks. Ryback had been WWE's latest big muscle man mm -hmm. to squash his way through jobbers all summer. And by the time Hell in a Cell rolled around and John Cena's injury meant he couldn't face Punk at the pay-per-view like originally intended, Ryback was their choice for a replacement suddenly igniting the push powder keg they'd been fueling. The match pulled a huge buy rate for the time, putting Ryback's mm -hmm. undefeated streak against the year-long reign of CM Punk in a Hell in a Cell stipulation that must have a finish. 
This was in a more innocent time, when Hell in a Cell matches had actual finishes, but WWE had booked themselves into a corner, not wanting to beat either guy, so they instead turned the Mad Ox Brad Maddox yeah. into a heel referee, yeah. pinning Ryback and forever halting whatever momentum he had going for him. Number eight. Tri yeah, at the time, Ryback, before all the Twitter antics now and all this other stuff, Ryback was hot. Like, super white hot. Yeah, he was kind of a Goldberg ripoff, but it worked for that time period. He was over. He was super over. The Feed Me More, all that shit worked. If there was any time for them to pull the trigger, and they could have pulled the trigger there, they definitely probably should have pulled the trigger there. But, once again, it's like WWE has a hard time booking people when, especially when it comes to Hell in a Cell, it just never really works for them. <laughs> Triple H beats Booker T at uh, WrestleMania Of course 19. this is on here. This one is, this is harmful on for an entirely different reason. Not only was the story naturally set up for Triple H to lose the World Heavyweight yep. Championship to Booker T, but it was kind of the only morally just way to go as well. Yeah. The build to that match at WrestleMania 19 has remained one of the most infamous ever because this is the story where the bad guy says racist <laughs> things yep. and then gets away with the racist things because in WWE, your heroes lose yeah remember kids your heroes lose here and as if screwing the easy moral victory over the bad guy story wasn't enough triple h took forever to pin booker after his pedigree making his opponent look even weaker booker t would never be taken seriously mm -mm. again as a top talent in wwe only winning the title years later as king booker number seven yeah, goldberg beats the theme super show makes sense this is on the list i will never understand why this was a thing no one can ever make me understand why this is a thing i get it why i get it it's all about that bottom dollar it's all about that money so i i understand why they did it it's still though sometimes those super showdowns saudi shows all that stuff Sometimes those overseas shows, they mess up the flow of what's going on for the main roster because they want certain people on the shows. They'll pay high dollar to have certain people on those shows. And it kind of messes up momentum for certain characters, a.k.a. The Fiend at the time. Showdown 2020. At one point, The Fiend wasn't just the hottest act in WWE, he was the hottest act in wrestling. Yes, His Hell in a Cell anticipation arguably overshadowing AEW Dynamite's debut on TV that same week. Just five months after that, Goldberg beat The Fiend for the Universal title at a show in Saudi Arabia. If you ever needed a visual representation of WWE choosing the then over elevating a star of the now and the forever, this was it. Gorg mm. didn't just beat the previously invincible Fiend, him. he beat him incredibly decisively, with somehow only the second worst jackhammer performed yeah. in Saudi Arabia. If Hell in a Cell 2019 was the first nail in the coffin, this yep, was that one was of the it. most over gimmicks in recent times it was fully been slain. Done. Speaking of Saudi Arabia, the place where nothing good happens in wrestling. Number six, Brock Lesnar beats Ricochet. That same show. <laughs> That's... <laughs> I didn't even watch that pay-per-view. I saw the results. I saw the match. I was like, bro, I'm this is fucking hot garbage. Uh it was hard to buy into this match on its own. I would have loved for them to at least give Ricochet some type of hope. But not only did Ricochet get destroyed, he got squashed. He got made to look like a god. He got made to look like a joke. Once he lost here, we knew he was going to lose. But once he lost here, I was like, yeah, it's over for him. It's over for him. It's done. He will never be anything more than a mid-card jobber at best. He may win titles in the mid-card division. They don't mean shit. They're literally paperweights. And look what we have here. He was the Intercontinental Champion. Could you really tell? Ah, oh, man, Ricochet deserved better. Super Showdown 2020, oh my god. Somehow Goldberg beating The Fiend wasn't the most damaging loss to come out of Super Showdown 2020. 
because even though The Fiend lost to Goldberg, his next appearance was staring down John Cena with the WrestleMania sign in view, which was followed up by the genre-breaking Firefly Funhouse That was match. a fun the match. The same can't be said for Ricochet. Yeah. Brock Lesnar broke and ripped him apart like a deer carcass at Super Showdown, and a few days later, Ricochet lost to Riddick Moss for the 24-7 title. Ricochet could be the best WWE high flyer ever, yep. but this match clipped his wings. The term burial is thrown around a lot these days, and more often than not, it isn't used appropriately. This, however, was a burial six feet deep that Ricochet has never been fully able to mm -mm. flip out of. This Number five, John Cena beats Bray Wyatt, WrestleMania 30. This is another situation. <laughs> Bray's featured on here a few times already. John Cena should have lost here. I don't know why they didn't book this. Bray Wyatt's gimmick, the Fireflies thing, if, which is so crazy how Bray finds a way to get over it every single time. His gimmick here at WrestleMania 30 was fantastic. The feud, the buildup was cool, loved it. All they had to do was have Bray win. And that, to me, right here, this would have really catapulted him. Because I, when him winning here... Would have probably changed a lot. It would have changed things for Bray Wyatt's future in WWE. He probably would have been a world champion much sooner. But they, for whatever reason, they didn't pull the trigger when they should have. It's not often that one guy has more than one of the most devastating losses in wrestling history, but here we are. I guess that's a testament to Bray Wyatt's creativity, yeah. that he managed to build a just as over new gimmick from the ruins of his first cult leader character. Wyatt family era Bray versus John Cena felt like a perfect narrative fit. Mm -hmm. Sure, the story got some supernatural spookiness, but it'll all be okay when Bray pins Cena at the grandest stage of them all. Oh no, wait, Cena wins, lol! WrestleMania 30 <laughs> saw Cena beat Wyatt clean. At the Clean, exact moment, bro. Wyatt needed a big stage, credible win to he fully reach that. his main event tier. Instead, afterwards, Bray went full spooky spooky in the aftermath, quickly devolved into a character that called upon spooky ghost children to do his bidding, which yeah. was not what made the original character work so well. Did. Number four, John Cena beats Damian Sandow for 2013. In a two-for-one special, today you don't just get to witness the harm being done to Damian Sandow, but also to the Money in the Bank contract, yep. a stipulation WWE really did not need to kill the way they did. After winning the World Heavyweight Championship from Alberto Del Rio, John Cena was jumped by Damian Sandow, who cashed in his Money in the Bank contract, and after some brief tussling, Cena dispatched Sandow out of the main event scene, to which he would never return. Yep. Sandow really went from Mr. Money in the Bank to losing title shots for the Intercontinental Championship in a matter of like two months. Mm -hmm. This loss was the end of any hope Sandow had yeah. as a main eventer, and even more still, this was the first real and true Money in the Bank cash in failure. WWE clearly wanted to get to the title unification that was just down the road mm -hmm. and ditch the Money in the Bank briefcase rather than complicate their storyline. Yeah, that he that <laughs> that that sucked for Damian man. Number three, John Cena beats Brock Lesnar. Extreme Rules 2012. <laughs> John Cena wins. On this Lol list. was a meme for a reason. I like it now because Cena's he had a on few this US title. Cena's definitely on this list for sure. Oh, <laughs> beat people he shouldn't have beat. Matches on Raw six years ago, but suffering succotash did he hold a lot of guys down. In this instance, Brock Lesnar had returned to WWE after eight years away during which time he had become UFC heavyweight mm -hmm. champion and the biggest pay-per-view box office draw of the previous four years. You could not make it easier to print money for the 18 months that followed his return. Think of how much bigger it would have felt to have seen an unbeaten Brock Lesnar face The Undertaker at WrestleMania yeah. for the streak. Instead, John Cena beat Brock Lesnar in his first match back. A lot of people weren't a big fan of that. I wasn't a big fan of that because it just... Doesn't make sense for John to win here. Granted, Brock got his win back. <laughs> I will say that. John Cena versus Brock at, uh, I forgot what SummerSlam that was. It was, uh, it was the SummerSlam after WrestleMania 30. That year, I have never seen someone get squashed as the champion. John Cena went in as the champion and got eviscerated. He got destroyed. So you can say 
Yes, he did lose here. But best believe Brock Lesnar got his win back in incredible fashion. What was it, like 17 suplexes John Cena received or something crazy like that? Never again will the stars align like this for WWE. And what makes it worse is Cena didn't even need this win. He lost to John Laurinaitis a month afterwards. Don't know what happened to that Lesnar guy, though. Hope he's all right. Cool tats. Number two, Team WWE beats the next. Oh, this was bad, too. This was definitely bad. Cena booking. wins low again. <laughs> it's arguably assistant. the most egregious oh, example. Was, Not just ruining one, two, three, four, five, or six wrestlers, but seven potential new stars <laughs> all in one match. You've almost got to admire the efficiency. John Cena led Team WWE into battle over the Nexus at SummerSlam 2010. This seven-on-seven -seven elimination match was the first time we had seen the Nexus on a big stage. And had they won this match, this could have made the careers of all involved, or at the very least, the top few. Yeah. Instead, this mostly even tag match just shifts into ludicrous speed and John Cena kicks out of a DDT on the floor <laughs> and beats Justin Gabriel and Wade Barrett two on one. Rarely yeah. have we ever seen such damage done to a group in one. I want to say later in hindsight, John Cena did realize that was a bad booking decision. Because I think uh, there are some interviews where uh, I believe Chris Jericho was like, I don't think this is the right decision here. I want to say it was Chris Jericho who was like, yeah, I don't think this is it. I think you need to put these guys over or whatnot. And they didn't do it. It wasn't until hindsight where it's like, uh. Probably should have put these guys over. They definitely, Nexus needed that win. They needed that win to even, at least some of these guys would have been more solidified probably sooner. But that never happened. Go. Chris Jericho and Edge would later reveal okay, there how go. they told John Cena this was a bad idea. They were right. Never again with the Nexus taken anywhere near as seriously, which Cena helped again the following night on Raw by comparing them all to fast food mascots. Honestly, this was so bad, I stopped watching WWE for half a year after it happened. Wow, damn. That's insane. And it, 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 I can understand someone being turned off by that. Like, damn, bro, like, he's a new talent. We can't even really get invested in, to, in him because the top guy just fucking buried him. Well, not buried him, but... Definitely derailed their push. I went off to become an Uber mark watching Ring of Honor and all the coolest indie promotions you haven't heard of. But even despite that, the thing that nearly killed my wrestling fandom, objectively, there is one loss that, ironically, beats all others. Uh -oh. Number one, Brock Lesnar beats Kofi Kingston, SmackDown. That's a good one. That's a really, really good one. Kofi Mania was killed. Everything that he had built, the matches, the gauntlets, all that, WrestleMania moment, all of that was killed in like 19 seconds on the debut of SmackDown on Fox. Instantly killed. And then after that, Kofi Kingston went back to feuding in the mid card and throwing pancakes. That right there killed any momentum Kofi would ever have again. The way they did Kofi Kingston there was cold-blooded. I am okay with Kofi losing to Brock. Hell, his title reign wasn't really that good, and that was booking decision. It, it wasn't really that good, unfortunately. I, I think the one thing I was looking forward to was the him and and Randy Orton, that was probably the most interesting feud he had. But that right there, they could have easily just had Kofi lose. Kofi try to fight back. He's not able to overcome the odds, and he loses. I'm okay with that. It's Brock Lesnar. But to have him lose in the way that they had him lose was truly despicable, bro. 2019. This one of WWE's biannual moments of giving fans what they wanted, they went right back hard to their default Your Heroes Lose bookie. Yeah. After one of the all time great WrestleMania moments, Kofi Kingston's WWE Championship reign was ended by Brock Lesnar in just seven seconds on the SmackDown. I was giving it too much justice. I said 19 seconds. It was just seven. 
That's even worse. Debut on Fox, killing Kofi so bad he fell from top champion to tag wrestler forevermore. Kofi has barely been in touching distance of the WWE Championship since, and despite one very effective detail where Kofi was asked about the title and he played it cool while also crushing a pancake in his hand, really, he hasn't added any of that fire into his character. Because in WWE, your heroes lose. They lose, and it doesn't mean anything. Remember, kids, your heroes lose then, now, yep. forever, together. Yeah, man, this is this is quite disappointing. It's a it's a very sad list, but I don't know. It's just I don't think WWE uh, they don't really know how to book a babyface. Recently, the one person they booked correctly as a ultimate babyface is Cody Rhodes, and that's only because I'm sure Cody's like, hey, I need to have creative control here. I'm not coming fucking back. So I'm glad Cody's been able to be the one baby face in this company that's getting done correctly. There's a other few, but top baby faces, definitely. Um, yeah, this is this is one of those things where it's like, jeez, man, god damn, when this is it's just Vince, Vince, the creative team, they just be thinking, oh, this this would be cool, this will work, this. This will make sense. And it'd be like, damn, you not only did that loss hurt the character, now no one can really truly buy into them. It's going to be hard for someone to buy into them again. The only person in this list where they were able to turn something into even better situation for them is Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt's original gimmick was over as hell. He couldn't win big matches. Guess what? He transformed himself into the fucking fiend, which was one of the most over things in wrestling that we have seen in quite some time. Got mega ultra over to only be in the same situation he was in with John Cena. He got himself over twice to fall down, to fall in by the wayside. Character destruction. Oh my gosh. And this is why I, I keep saying this to everyone. Oh, a whole brain comes back. Do you want him to come back? No. So he can get over again for WWE to do the same thing? No. I want Bray to do whatever he wants to do, go wherever he wants to go. As long as they treat him and his character with some type of redeeming qualities and, and with care, I'm happy wherever he goes. But do not, he does not need to go back to WWE, at least not right now. No, because he does not clearly have that type of pull in the back where he can be like, I need to have creative control over my character in certain, in majority of situations because this ain't it. So, no, I do not want Bray to come back, come back. I need him to focus whatever else outside of WWE because I do not trust Vince McMahon when it comes to to anything that Bray does, or oh, he'll be on another list like this if he comes back to WWE and loses important matches. So comment down below. Let me know what was a particular loss from a, a, a wrestler that, that may not even been on this list that you felt like derailed their push or their momentum so bad that could, they really haven't recovered from it. Um, I was surprised um, that they didn't mention the Hell in a Cell with Seth Rollins in... The Fiend, that ultimately initially started The Fiend's push being derailed. His push momentum started to really slow after that atrocious match. And then he was able to regain it again, and then it got derailed completely by Goldberg. So that's the one I can easily think of off my head. So let me know down below. But I appreciate all love and support. Row 2, 90K, appreciate y'all keeping with me. See you on the next one. Peace.